welcome back maybe to uh, the 30th annual Vanier College Symposium on the Holocaust and Genocide. Welcome to people here in the room. Welcome to people uh, taking in this uh, uh, very interesting talk um, virtually, right? So I'm here to present to you, you know, uh, a very distinguished speaker for this talk uh, about a very contemporaneous issue and thing that's happening right now that we're all aware of. But we'll get that to we'll get to that in the, uh, in a few seconds. Uh, before I do, I want to introduce uh, our speaker for today. So uh, I'm talking to you about Professor John Packer. Okay, he's the Newberger Dessen Professor of International Conflict Resolution in the Faculty of Law and Director of the Human Rights Research and Education Center at the University of Ottawa. Uh, Professor Packer has previously taught at the Fletcher School in, uh, at Tufts University in the US and also in the University of Essex in the UK. He's also held fellowships at Cambridge and Harvard universities, and he's also lectured at academic and professional institutions around the world over, right? But his 30 year career uh, doesn't limit itself to just academics. Over that time, uh, for about 20 years, he's also been an intergovernmental official uh, at various international organizations, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, the International Labor Organization, uh, the Office of the Higher Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, uh, the United Nations, uh, the Department for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, right? And he's advised numerous governments and communities uh, over the years, um, uh, uh, over 50 countries, right? And as a UN staff member in the early 1990s, he's investigated serious violations of human rights in Iraq, Afghanistan, Burma slash Myanmar, right? And from 1995 to 2004, he was senior legal advisor, then became the first director of the office of the OSC High Commissioner on National Minorities, uh, advising in conflicts across Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, including at that, you know, during that period, uh, you know, which is of very uh, high relevance here today, mediating Ukraine-Russia relations. Um, in, between 2020, uh, 2012 and 2014, I should say, he was also constitutions and process design expert on the UN standby team of mediation experts. And his research focuses, uh, you know, um, at the intersection of human rights, including minority rights and security, uh, especially focusing on conflict prevention, quiet diplomacy, international mediation, transitional arrangements, constitutional and legal reform, and institutional developments at domestic and multilateral levels. So folks, you could see by this uh, lengthy introduction, um, that we have a highly accomplished individual here uh, to deliver a very important talk. Um, and the talk is titled Living Together in the Era of Extreme Nationalism, the Ukraine-Russia Conflict, which is uh, actually unfolding as we speak, unfortunately. Professor Packer, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you so much uh, for, first of all, the invitation to join you. And thank you very much for the uh, generous introduction. Um, uh, I guess the, the sum of what you recounted is that I'm old. <laughs> I've been around for a while. I don't think I'm old, but um, uh, life has, has uh, given me the privilege of some opportunity to be in many situations and to uh, see the uh, dark side of humanity. Uh, my early work was in the investigation of serious violations of human rights. Um, actually, my earliest work was helping to build up some institutions. Um, you mentioned the International Labor Organization, and, and many people are unaware that the International Labor Organization was actually established in the Treaty of Versailles as an institution to overcome the First World War and, uh, and the division between uh, workers uh, employers and states uh, in the uh, industrial and post-industrial uh, world. And uh, of course, we know that there were uh, peasant revolutions and, uh, and uh, vanguard revolutions and so forth, um, part of which led up to or uh, were uh, attending the, uh, the First World War. Uh, so that was one element. And uh, the other element in that was about uh, the relationship of minorities to majorities in emerging uh, popular democracies. Um, so in, in, I, I worked with the International Labor Organization to help develop some of their standards, some of their uh, the, the norms about how, how we live together 
um, uh, pursuing our interests, our competing interests uh, to develop economically, socially, but also culturally. Uh, and uh, the International Labor Organization remains a very important uh, institution. But I mention it because it was brought and still is considered uh, an important element of progress as we try and overcome uh, the, the bloody character of, uh, of our species. Uh, since time immemorial, we, we fight over things for which we compete. We kill each other. And unfortunately, um, the, the post-Cold War uh, era, 100 or uh, 90 years, 100 years later, uh, we, uh, we find ourselves um, unfortunately returning uh, to uh, even to interstate wars for, for some years in the, in the last 20, 25 years, there was a feeling that maybe conflict had changed, it had transformed and it was more in the, in the character of intrastate, you know, in civil wars and so forth. But now we increasingly have interstate uh, conflicts uh, and we have a real nightmare scenario, scenario right now or situation with uh, uh, not only one of the ostensible guarantors of the post Second World War era, the Russian Federation uh, as successor to the Soviet Union and a permanent member of the Security Council, in fact, uh, violating, uh, in fact, in the position of an aggressor breaching fundamental tenets of the UN Charter and of public international law, uh, but also uh, challenging these basic ideas of solving disputes in peaceful ways. Um, in, the, in the early 1990s, after working for the International Labor Organization, I, I worked, as was mentioned, for uh, investigating serious violations of human rights initially under Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And, uh, and, and there are some elements of similarity um, that I could recount. Uh, but what I discovered in that process was that our instruments for um, cataloging the violations, that we, we already by then, in the early 1990s, the internet was created. Uh, we had satellite photography. In fact, the, uh, uh, what the um, CIA called Northern Gulf Affairs, meaning the uh, area north of the, uh, in the northern part of the Persian Gulf and on the border of Iran, Iraq was amongst the most photographed areas in the world through aerial photography and satellite photography. And, and, and so I just want to emphasize at that point, we actually knew a lot about what was going on. Um, young people may not know that, for example, it was the Americans and specifically Donald Rumsfeld under uh, Ronald Reagan who gave the, uh, the uh, regime of Saddam Hussein uh, chemical weapons which were a bulwark against uh, a war of attrition with Iran. So it's not like we were unaware of these risks or unaware what was happening. There had already been severe repression of the Kurds in the North and so forth. So um, we could see, and, and I wanna just point that out because again today in the context of uh, Ukraine and Russia, the argument that this somehow surprised us uh, you know, there, those people were saying uh, absolutely sure that uh, Russia would not um, not invade uh, Ukraine, uh, or even while um, uh, President Biden and others were calling upon Americans and others to leave because the evidence was pointing in that direction, there were those who refused to kind of connect the dots. It wasn't just a connecting the dots uh, matter. In my view, it was, it was uh, tangibly evident. So I don't think we can claim anymore this kind of, you know, if only we knew. If only we knew is not a credible position anymore. We know an awful lot. We know the causes. We know uh, the lesson of, uh, from, from the title of your um, uh, seminars this week, uh, Holocaust and Genocide. I mean, that was one of the great lessons of the Second World War uh, and why we declared as a, as a species, essentially, never again was that we knew the causal link between the extreme alienation, the degradation, dehumanization of some people, that these were stepping stones towards much worse to come. Um, I draw your attention to the work of uh, Dr. Gregory Stanton and the NGO Genocide Watch, uh, of which I'm privileged to be an advisor uh, in Washington, DC. But Dr. Stanton uh, elaborated the concept of uh, 10 stages of genocide. Uh, and the point is that this is entirely foreseeable and we know the progression. It is a, a repeated progression. And so we can foresee it and we can act to forestall it. 
uh, or even to um, prevent in, in, in the deeper sense of trying to resolve the causes or the, the, the elements which are, are brought to bear. So um, again, it's not only that uh, if only we knew in the sense of we're cognizant or we're, um, uh, could comprehend or see some of the elements, we can see those, but we actually know in the sense of understanding, we actually understand how these things uh, occur. Uh, and, and so the real question is, is what are we doing about them? Now, the topic that I've uh, selected today is to focus on the rise of extreme nationalism. Uh, nationalism as a, as a political project, and that's what it is, it is to take this concept of nation uh, and uh, add the, the, the suffix uh, ism as a political project of organization um, and to, uh, first of all, uh, adopt it as an organizing principle uh, for a political community, and then to try and coincide nation with state. I, so this is uh, well known, there's a field of studies on, on a nation and nationalism. Uh, I, you might be surprised to know that this is a relative recent, relatively recent development in, in uh, history. Uh, 300 years ago, no one ever talked about the nation. Uh, it's really a, a late 18th century and 19th century development. Um, since time immemorial, humans lived um, in very mixed multi and uh, cultural and multilinguistic and, and societies, a lot of uh, a variation. And the organizing principle was not about a nation, um, uh, nor and certainly not about democracies, which is a, a even more uh, recent phenomenon. Uh, so uh, it became really developed in, in Europe. It's a European idea. Uh, and, and the nation is uh, not anywhere defined for information in international law and very weakly defined even in international relations. In fact, probably one of the best definitions, kind of strangely, was uh, provided by uh, Joseph Stalin in 1913 when he wrote a book on, on uh, the nationality principle, uh, because under, under uh, communism and the theories of communism, remember, Marxist communism was universalist. All the workers of the world unite, and it wasn't about ethnic or national groups. But they were aware, particularly in Tsarist uh, Russia, that there was a tremendous diversity of communities, linguistically, culturally, and faith-wise. And, uh, and they needed some way, if they were going to, quote, liberate them, to also vindicate their own uh, struggles uh, for freedom from the yoke of uh, Tsarist colonialism. So Kyrgyz and, and uh, Georgians, Stalin himself was a Georgian and so forth. So they had to figure a way to kind of square that circle. And, and Stalin wrote this, uh, this uh, booklet um, uh, in which he defined a nation as a, a people of shared uh, historical uh, descent, uh, even potentially the idea of bloodline, uh, which means uh, to say a kind of racialist or biological descent very, very problematical from a human species and a human rights idea, uh, but also having shared um, a place or space. Uh, so uh, where one is from in the geographic sense, homeland, the idea of homeland coinciding with a certain people, the sharing of faith. So a, a kind of a worldview, um, uh, even potentially a cosmology or an epistemology of understanding truth and, and, and what exists. Uh, uh, and also sharing attributes of a cultural character such as language. So these are elements which are not necessarily, uh, but are typically uh, defined in terms of nations. Uh, um, there are of course groups, for example, the Swiss are famously a nation uh, that does not share a language or a religion. They are a multicultural nation, um, a multilinguistic nation, so, and Swiss, if you ever get the opportunity to go to Switzerland or meet a Swiss person, they will tell you there is a very strong sense of being Swiss without identifying or reducing it to being, um, for example, French or German or Italian or a small, small group called the Romash, uh, a Latin linguistic origin group, or between uh, Catholics or Protestants and so forth. So uh, they're not defined in those terms. It is the sense of a political project. Now, the problematical aspect of the nation is coinciding it uh, with territory or with the state. And, and for your uh, information, the state is something that is known in international law and relations. The state is defined as a, 
um, uh, a defined territory, um, not perfectly. Uh, even Canada's frontiers are not perfectly defined. They are disputed. For example, the Northwest Passage and so forth. We claim it, but others dispute it, including friends. Countries like Denmark are, are contentious uh, in their respect in the respect of our specific frontiers. Uh, the USA also. Uh, so uh, a defined territory, a permanent population. That is to say, a, a, a population that is not transient, um, uh, that has an, a government that's effective in, in, in the territory and persons and is recognized, has relationships with other, with other states. So that, that's something we know. So Canada is a state, much less than we would say Canada is a nation. In fact, the, the language of nations in Canada is quite problematical. Who are they? We know that, for example, the problem that uh, former prime minister uh, Harper had in, in addressing the question, is it Quebec, the geographical entity and administrative province, a nation, or is it the Quebecois who are a nation? What does that mean exactly? We, we're, it, it is a, a challenging uh, question. And can it change? Can nations, uh, uh, which they do, they are dynamic. People intermarry, um, even uh, cultural elements change, people change their faith and so forth. So uh, just if we think about it ourselves, it's problematical. But if we try to coincide nation with state, and, and that's uh, a term that's used in international relations, the nation state, uh, this becomes problematical. It was advanced uh, by Woodrow Wilson as a president of the USA at the end of the First World War, where he, uh, as part of a project to break up uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and, and others that had been um, seen to be partly problematical in the, in the creation of uh, the causes of the First World War, uh, and so he declared in a famous speech uh, called his 14 points that uh, the idea that every nation should have its home. Well, now, who defines each nation? And if we say each should have its home, so does that mean exclusively? Uh, for information, there's something like 7,000 discrete languages in the world. There are undoubtedly, uh, from an ethno cultural and political perspective, at least many hundreds of putative nations, some which are pretty clear. For example, Kurds. Uh, Kurds often call themselves the largest nation without a state. There's at least 30 million or more. Um, one of the largest Kurdish cities in the world might surprise you is Istanbul. Uh, but there are very um, highly uh, uh, let me say common uh, shared uh, ethnicities in cities like Van, uh, or Diyarbakir in the southeast of Turkey, which are very strongly Kurdish in their ethnocultural and even political sense of belonging, uh, so their relations. Um, but there are also Kurds who are distributed between Iraq, Iran, Syria, um, uh, uh, I think Azerbaijan, um, uh, of course Turkey, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and so a project to coincide all the Kurds uh, who, by the way, have divisions. Uh, it's not quite clear about if we speak about Kurdish language. There are deeply uh, significant differences in, in, in at least uh, um, dialects, if not languages. In fact, there's an old joke that sociolinguists like to speak about uh, or say that if you ask them what's the difference between a language and a dialect, and the answer is that a language has an army and a navy. Uh, in other words, it's a matter of force. It's not a matter of linguistic science because the, the barriers are, are, all languages are porous and all are dynamic. Uh, but nonetheless, there are at least four major dialects uh, of Kurdish that are not fully uh, comprehensible. Uh, as a result of colonial or external powers, they have different, uh, different scripts. So for example, many Kurds in Iraq uh, were Arabicized, used the Arabic uh, script. Uh, those in Turkey use a Latin script. Um, uh, those in Iran uh, who have been um, under Farsi, uh, Persian uh, regime and, and, and so forth. So there's, there's diversity in this, even those of the former Soviet Union that would have used, um, used Cyrillic. So uh, this idea of coinciding becomes problematical, uh, especially if it is understood in, in exclusionary terms, my nation, my home, and then in a kind of hierarchical sense, that my nation is uh, God-given or is, the, um, is, is somehow rooted, uh, to use the metaphor uh, of land, you know, in, in the very uh, land, the earth, the soil, my homeland, 
and that therefore those who are not part of the nation are not equally legitimate, are not even um, uh, meritorious, uh, and in fact are often considered to be aliens uh, to that land. And so there are many, for example, European constitutions today, uh, for example, the Slovak constitution, which speaks of uh, the Slovak nation as the founding nation, as the, uh, 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 the basic nation of the Slovak Republic. And then it speaks in a separate line of national minorities who are kind of indicated as uh, less than, certainly less than the state forming nation. They are maybe uh, even so far as they may be granted equal citizenship uh, ostensibly, their position is subsidiary or secondary to the state forming nation. So you can see immediately this problematical hierarchy. I mean, we had something of this in a Canadian historical context between the position of English and French. Uh, and that's why our constitution in 1982 was so crucial. Uh, and even before that, the adoption of bilingualism, biculturalism, this idea of e equality. And some people use the terminology of parity uh, and not just parity or equality in practical terms, the use of language and so forth, but the term that sometimes uses parity of esteem, that there would be equal prestige, equal dignity, recognition, and so forth. Uh, of course, in Canada, we have many, many other groups, and they're supposed to all be equal citizens. You'll remember Justin Trudeau, so Pierre Trudeau's son, speaking not just about two founding nations, but speaking now about a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian, irrespective of uh, national origin, country, birth of place, place of birth, uh, faith, language, and so forth. Uh, now, what happens when this idea of nationalism as a political project becomes imbued uh, with ideas of uh, the other as threat, the, the, uh, and that my nation and some kind of a manifest destiny, a right to govern or rule uh, over others um, comes into uh, play? And there are, of course, politicians and many, many uh, actors, including religious leaders and so forth, who elevate this idea, who, who, uh, whose politics follows this idea and the ideal that the nation pure, the pure nation should coincide with the state. Well, this begs a lot of questions. I mean, I just mentioned purity. Who, who exactly is pure and what are the, the limitations of purity? Who, who is purely I don't know what you want to invoke uh, uh, as, a, as a reference. I, I, my, my parents emigrated from the United Kingdom in Australia of Anglo background, you know, to, to immediately call them pure anything, I don't know. I mean, the, uh, the English are famously a bastard nation as they call themselves, because they're so mixed with Anglo-Saxons and thousands of years of immigration and so forth. So I can tell you my own family background had Huguenots and had Irish and had uh, Saxons and so forth. So uh, this, these ideas become highly problematical, um, uh, but they were the core of the ideas of, of, of course, Nazi and other philosophies. So, you know, if you read Mein Kampf, and I in, encourage you to actually look at it, which Hitler wrote in 1924, and you'll see that there are these pages where he invokes, uh, and it become principal themes of, of the, the, the Volk uh, the bloodline, the Teutonic race, the, the, the bloodline, uh, and he elevates that into an idea of the Aryan race, the purest uh, of, the, of the Germanic uh, line. Uh, but he also uh, elevates it in terms of uh, a policy of chauvinism, that, that the Germans have a right, uh, a kind of God-given right uh, to rule. And then he has a hierarchy, uh, and he identifies pretty clearly not only who are subsidiary or worse than that, are threats. Uh, where the other now become uh, not only a, in competition uh, with the rightful uh, rule, uh, but also uh, pose, pose a threat to that. And here he invokes uh, kind of bizarrely, I have to tell you, if you read Mein Kampf, you have to read it in historical context, certain things which were happening. But suddenly around page 100, I can tell you, he, he suddenly uh, uh, blames uh, the Jews, for example, or he blames uh, he, he refers to the Slavs and, and others, but also to uh, delinquent or perverse elements. And as you may know, uh, the, the Roma or the gypsies, as they're pejoratively referred to, or, uh, for example, uh, the disabled uh, and so forth, as, as costs and as, uh, and as um, uh, drains on, on and, 
basically holding back the nation and so forth. So you can immediately see this dehumanization, this othering as threat, which, which really drove this idea of, of um, the chauvinism and the superiority uh, that, that then became incorporated in the politics and the political project of Nazism. Uh, so, uh, and led to the final solution, you know, what to do about it ultimately was elimination. And, you know, uh, I often say to people, diversity is a fact. Our societies are diverse. That's not a political question. That's a fact. There are different languages, different faiths, different interests, needs, and aspirations, and so forth. Uh, the, the political question is what you do about it, what you want to do about it. And of course, the horrendous conclusion of the Nazis in, in the uh, conference of the Wannasee in a, in a chalet or a, a chateau rather outside Berlin was this idea of final solution and, and ultimately uh, you know, the Holocaust, the, the elimination. And unfortunately, it's not alone. So we've seen these genocides that, that um, Raphael Lemkin uh, a, a Jew, incidentally, from the city of Lvov, where we're watching Ukraine uh, uh, right now today, and we see many things from Lvov. Well, Lemkin came from Lvov, and he came up with this idea that there's not just homicide, using the Latin phrases, the killing uh, of humans killing humans, but the genus, the group, uh, and that this was uh, especially abhorrent. Uh, but more than abhorrent, problematical, because how do we live together if these kind of paradigms, if these kind of ideas uh, pertain? So we saw at the end of the Second World War that there was an intimate linkage between this, uh, these kind of projects and this kind of thinking uh, that we not only adopted prohibitions such as the, the convention, 1948 convention on the prohibition and the punishment of the, of the crime of genocide, uh, but uh, uh, but we, uh, sorry, the prevention and the, and the uh, 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 punishment of the crime of genocide, uh, but that we should take all of our steps and efforts uh, to for, foreclose uh, these abhorrent ideas. And we should build a different, uh, a different society based on, importantly, human rights. The idea that we are born free and equal. I mean, Article One of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I, I encourage you to read, basically asserts another statement. It's not actually a right. It says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Um, th that's an assertion, but it's a foundational a premise about the human species. And from that then unfold a series of other, other human rights. Now, what's happened in recent times, and I link it with Ukraine and Russia, is that unfortunately nationalism and its extreme uh, articulations have had a resurgence in many, many years. Uh, the last, I would say, at least 20, 25 years. After the Cold War, there was a kind of discrediting. There was a, a certain breath of fresh air where certain, um, uh, certain groups that had been under the yoke of oppression. So for example, small, sometimes called small nations. I don't mean small in, the, uh, in, in, a, in a substantive sense. I mean, numerically, such as Estonians, Latvians, and others which had been russified and subjected to terrible repression, uh, had a rebirth. We were able to kind of claim their place, their space, and with pride and with, in freedom, uh, restore their, their sovereignties and so forth. But there have been other examples where, where the othering has been replicated. And we see this kind of, uh, today in places like uh, uh, Hungary, the election just, uh, just last week, uh, where Viktor Orban and his, um, uh, uh, Fidesz party was uh, restored with a larger majority, but very worryingly, an even further right-wing uh, extremist party uh, was elected into parliament for the first time. They beat a 5% threshold. So there's now an extreme right party of Hungarian nationalists in, in, the new, in the new parliament, which pushes everything to the right. And similarly, the kind of um, ideas about the others and the threats, and of course, we hear this in the language uh, on our television right now, where uh, unfortunately, I mean, it's understandable, but it's, uh, it's very troubling when we start to hear uh, Ukrainians under extreme threat now invoking language to uh, speak of all Russians as enemy, uh, to reduce Russians as uh, uh, dehumanized terms. Speaking about Russians, apparently there's a new terminology of, of categorizing Russians as orcs, some kind of an othering, not human 
idea and even referring to some of them in, in uh, explicitly less than human terms as insects and so forth. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not trying to be insensitive to why this kind of uh, feeling is generated. Obviously there are horrendous situations and, and many, many people are now saying, you know, that they, of course it's reasonable. They hate those and those associated with them who have caused extreme harm. Uh, and, and they call for uh, retribution, for revenge explicitly. But you can see this cycle, this kind of vicious cycle, uh, which is then supported by also ideas uh, of, of uh, chauvinism and nationalism. So right now, for example, I don't think almost anyone has heard a word about the Roma in Ukraine in the last, uh, last several months. There are as many as a half a million Roma in, in Ukraine who were already uh, treated very poorly. There had been murders and, and extreme exclusions and, um, uh, and so forth. Uh, and there, there was an effort by the United Nations Development Program, for example, and UN Women uh, to uh, draw attention and to protect particularly Roma women who are very vulnerable and so forth. Uh, and now they are extremely vulnerable. Many Roma were not permitted, for example, to be refugees. Uh, neighboring states have, have actually weeded them out and stopped them. Uh, Moldova, for example, where I work today, and, and we're still in a very fragile democratization process. So there's a, there's a lot of complexity uh, in, in this. But this idea of, of nationalism, extreme nationalism, unfortunately, is not limited to Europe. And, and I'll just draw your attention to a lot of what is happening now in places like India, where the uh, nationalist, um, uh, principally Hindu nationalist, uh, ruling party uh, BJP under, under uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi um, are, are explicitly uh, labeling and targeting non-Hindus and specifically Muslims and explicitly discriminating, for example, in citizenship laws and so forth. There's 2 million, uh, for example, Assamese right now who are being stripped of Indian nationality, uh, essentially based on their uh, Muslim faith. Uh, so you, we can immediately start to think, well, what, what is the reaction of those people? Do you think they simply throw up their hands and say, well, right, you are. India is a majority uh, or large uh, Hindu uh, population. So we're happy to give up our nationality rights. We're happy to give up our, uh, our protections for equal, equal protection of the law and so forth. But that's not the reaction. But the, the natural reaction is people people, first of all, resent it, but second of all, they, they struggle against it and they find the allies they can find and so forth. So we're, we're, we're on this tread, we're on this, uh, this unfortunately, um, uh, mill, uh, where this treadmill, where, um, where the, the nationalism spins uh, and, and becomes actually uh, a, a, a almost self-fulfilling uh, prophecy because it generates the hatred, which generates the reactions, and you know, if you start being shot at because you are ascribed membership of these groups, which is what happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you know, you, you can't suddenly stop and, and dis, uh, dissociate. You have to protect yourself. And this is the kind of logic. So uh, this has happened in Iraq where you had a lot of intermarriage between, um, uh, for example, Kurds and Arabs uh, in cities like Kirkuk, very mixed. But you know, when you started to have the dissolution of the society and the labeling, well, then it became relevant. People are very afraid of their own name. If your name Ali, which is a classic name associated with Shiism, for example, you, you suddenly, you, you might wanna have a second document which has another name that's uh, like uh, Otman or something, which is a Sunni name uh, and so forth. You wanna protect against it. And this becomes very poisonous uh, in, in this notion. Uh, let me finish by saying kind of what we can do about this extreme nationalism. Uh, not only we have to fight it, we have to uh, contest it, and we have to show with de deliberation and effort how, uh, how discrimination is, uh, is forestalled and eliminated, how people are able to have opportunities uh, of equality, equality in not only uh, respect of their needs and their interests, but also in, in elements of prestige and respect that, that people are equally uh, respected and have genuinely equal opportunity. Uh, so these are the kind of counteractions, the other side, and we know how to do that. Not only we know what's wrong, we know how to count, counteract that. Uh, but I want to say just two words about justice, uh, which is uh, there, there's a lot of attention to ideas around uh, justice in terms of accountability. Um, and, and it may be of interest and important for you to know that there are 
that there were really four concepts of justice. There's uh, distributive justice, um, access to goods and needs and you know opportunities. We're, we've heard some of that in the election, uh, sorry, the budget yesterday in Canada um, of, of having uh, access to health care, uh, dental care, pharma care, and so forth. The, these are uh, housing rights. Uh, this is attending needs. And the idea here is that people have, we're distributing the opportunities and wealth so that well-being can be equally pursued. There's also procedural justice, fairness in processes. We have uh, equal uh, equality before the law, for example. Uh, and, and then there's retribution and res restorative justice. Accountability is very much fixed in the idea of retribution. You identify the wrongdoer, the perpetrator, and you effectively punish them. You may punish them by not only the result of a process, but you, re you, re you remove uh, freedoms. For example, you, we put our, our form uh, of treating uh, wrongdoers is we may incarcerate them, which is both to protect the public, but also a punishment to deprive them of liberty uh, and so forth. Uh, and the other element of justice or the other uh, main form of justice is restorative justice. And restorative justice is something that associates with ideas of repair, to overcome the wrong, but also to risk either restitute, to, to put back to the situation which was damaged in the first place, or to have other forms of repair, social forms, such as apology, uh, where we hear a lot in our country from indigenous peoples, the idea of reconciliation. And I just want to leave you with the idea that going forward in life, in a complex world in which we live, with a lot of wrongs and a lot of damage and a lot of hurt and harm, the, the real essential thing we must focus on is restorative justice. Um, revenge is, is, first of all, a poor counsel. Anger is, and revenge is a poor counsel of how to live well together. Um, but it's, it's of a limited utility. And particularly for these inter-community and interstate relations, you cannot arrest and put in jail an entire nation or an entire country. That's just a, per, a bizarre idea, a, a non-workable, a non-starter. So we have to think more about how we can uh, stop the cycle, the vicious cycle, and end these kind of uh, causes. And we can turn that around in a way in which we, uh, of course, uh, acknowledge, and we should not forget, we should never forget the harm. Uh, the memory is very important. But we need to be able to bridge that and find a way to live together, a modus vivendi, a way of living together that is equally respectful and has the prospects of living in the future in a way which is fulfilling uh, and, and has the, uh, the sustainability of peaceful, foreseeable, uh, and fulfilling lives in peace and in prosperity. And that is done through restorative justice. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to address you. Uh, I think we've got some time for some questions or some comments, and I very much uh, am interested to hear any of your thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Packer. As a political science teacher and an international relations expert, I often tell my students that I'm not gonna talk to them about very uplifting stuff most of the time. Unfortunately, this was very sobering but you know, uh, it needs to be talked about, right? So thank you very much. So folks, the, the floor is open for questions. Raise your hands. If you're close to that mic, you can walk over to it. If not, I can, I can bring my mic over to you. So anybody that has any questions, please. And also people that are in cyberspace, obviously, uh, you can write your questions out in the Q and A feature and we'll read them out here so that uh, Professor Packer can address and answer them, all right? I think there is something in the Q&A. Is it possible that I'm seeing a question? Let me read the question. It's a very important question uh, right. and, and observation. So the, the uh, person says, uh, extreme nationalism of Ukrainians provoked the genocide war of Putin's Russia against Ukraine, question mark. This Putin invasion and genocidal policies began in 2014. And then he says, funny way to give a lecture on the present war of Russian imperialism on Ukraine. So let me reply to that. I absolutely never said, and I do not uh, assert uh, that uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainians provoked genocidal uh, war in Putin's Russia. Uh, let me be very clear. Uh, uh, and then I will disagree with the 
person asking a question on some of the anti-scenes of this. I, and incidentally, I've been involved in Ukraine since 1993 or four, uh, and I advised on the uh, constitution, 1996 of Ukraine, very specific provisions. I uh, helped negotiate the constitution of uh, the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, 1998. I've worked with many governments, um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll comment on this in a moment. Uh, but first of all, it's very, very clear that the immediate antecedent or cause of the current war, which is what it is, between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, uh, is a breach of, uh, of the foundational tenets of the United Nations, and actually even going further back uh, to the Peace of Westphalia, 1648, which is to say that there was an aggression, an act by the Russian Federation to use force uh, imposed upon and in, uh, in the territory of Ukraine. So you will hear phrases like the territorial integrity, meaning the physical uh, frontiers of Ukraine have been breached uh, by uh, Russia. And I agree with the uh, person who posed the question uh, that uh, that, uh, that breach uh, already was 2014 in Crimea uh, and then in, in uh, the area called the Donbass in Eastern, Eastern Ukraine. Uh, I would actually say that the, the, the uh, antagonism of this goes much further back, uh, certainly to the mid-1990s, uh, and, uh, and, and I'll uh, comment on that in just a second. So there's, there's no doubt that this is an act of aggression uh, by one state over another, and that's what's extremely serious because Russia has uh, duties under the uh, uh, United Nations uh, charter as a as a essentially a guarantor of peace and security as a permanent member, uh, and it has uh, it's breached its own bilateral uh, agreements. And I I actually contributed to in 1997, signed by President Yeltsin, an agreement recognizing officially uh, the uh, the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Uh, never mind the 1994 Budapest Agreement. Uh, which was a memorandum signed by, uh, not only by Russia, but signed also by the United Kingdom and the United States of America, who uh, uh, accepted a responsibility to, to uh, assure uh, the protection of Ukraine uh, when Ukraine, uh, Kazakhstan, and Belarus became parties to the non-proliferation treaty. That's what actually happened in, in Budapest in 1994 at a OSCE, the first OSCE summit. It, it would be, CSE became OSCE. Um, and so we may ask, you know, who dropped the ball on that? But, but in any event, uh, th there's no doubt that Russia uh, uh, had recognized the sovereign equality of, uh, of Ukraine and violated it. Uh, now, if we ask about uh, some of the antecedents of this, so my, in my own view, uh, one of the very serious antecedents, which was very clear, was December 1999. So uh, Vladimir Putin became president in 1999 of the Russian Federation after Yeltsin, but the, the Russian Duma accepted a law called the Law on the Protection of Compatriots Abroad in December 1999. And that law expresses and commits the Russian Federation to protect what they call compatriots, abroad meaning not in the territory of the Russian Federation. A compatriot is an ethnic Russian who is neither a citizen, a national of the Russian Federation, nor in the territory of the Russian Federation. That just means someone who shares ethnicity or language, or it's not actually clear who it exactly in, includes. They certainly would have said it included anyone who held a propitska in the Soviet Union, meaning a residence permit, which means uh, tens of millions of Russians in neighboring states, in Kazakhstan, Ukraine, all the Baltic states, Georgia, and elsewhere. Uh, and basically, Russia arrogated to itself an authority, contrary to international law, to protect these persons. That was an expression of a national project, a nationalist project, uh, and, and a very, very dangerous one. Uh, and unfortunately, a number of Western countries replicated this. I can tell you the Romanians did the same. Of course, the Serbians did, had, had earlier done the same, uh, and many others. Uh, I mean, even America does something like this. It asserts the right to protect Americans anywhere in the world. Now, Americans as citizens is one thing, that, that's a, uh, but they have to respect the sovereignty of other states. But when, when America goes and, for example, arrests people in Mexico without the permission of the Mexican government, that's a breach of Mexican sovereignty. 
So I'm, I'm trying to identify how that na nation nationalism paradigm here is problematical, especially when put in extreme forms, such as Russia did in 1999. Uh, so, uh, but it also is very clear that things like uh, failures to respect and fully validate uh, um, uh, minority rights, human rights, and so forth, feeds into that narrative and becomes a pretext for this extremism. For example, uh, you know, a place like Crimea, which is 70% uh, ethnic Russian, long history, uh, uh, historical association uh, membership of uh, Russian uh, 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 colonial uh, uh, state uh, for hundreds of years, uh, very close connections between Moscow, uh, investments of, uh, of uh, for example, uh, Russian uh, interests, uh, Yalta, for example, one of the great Black Sea resorts of the former Soviet Union and many, many Russians, the presence of the Black Sea fleet in Sevastopol and so forth. I'm just identifying elements here which play into the Russian narrative of, uh, or the narrative of extreme nationalism and are easily manipulated by politicians. And this is why the, the Russian population is not just sympathetic to the idea of Russian um, politics now and support for, for Putin, but very high support for Russian uh, so-called retaking or the, the uh, annexation uh, of, uh, of Crimea. We, we have to understand it. And if we don't understand it, then we're not able to respond to it and to turn it back. Um, sorry for the long answer, but it's a very important uh, subject. Uh, if, the, if the person asking thinks it's funny way in, in the sense of strange, I agree it's an unusual way because unfortunately we have terribly simplistic paradigms being promoted on both sides and leading us into an escalation which includes a potential nuclear war. So we should not be simplistic. We should understand the complexity. Thank there are two other questions uh, in, in, in yep. the, uh, but if you throw some from the floor. Put, the, put them up on the screen maybe. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I can. Um, oh, oh, sorry. I have a question from the audience first. Uh, so. Sure. Um, hi, Professor. Thank you so much for your time. Um, my question, it's a bit loaded, but um, could you give us historical examples of reconciliation and how we, as you, who are willing to break this cycle, this generational cycle, can take steps as to ensure that reconciliation happens? It's a great question, uh, and, and thank you. And, and, you know, first of all, let me just say that our species has historically invested enormously in war making, not in peacemaking. And, uh, and we still do that. And uh, you know, we've just seen in a matter of weeks, huge increases in, um, in a war fighting. I don't know if you know, as a Canadian, as a young Canadian citizen, uh, just even a few years ago, our own government, not the 8 billion uh, added to our defense uh, spending uh, this, uh, in the budget yesterday, uh, but uh, I think two years ago, our, our government increased defense spending uh, by a huge percentage. I think it was 70%. Uh, you know, because we, we were well under 1%. And of course, uh, President Trump was very critical. So we went up to about 1.4%. We increased that without a single debate in our parliament, not a single debate in our parliament. Uh, but we're spending billions and billions uh, globally. Uh, you, you probably don't know, but at the end of the 1990s, the end of the Cold War, there was a whole discussion about the so-called peace dividend, that there was peace. You know, Francis Fukuyama wrote that we, uh, uh, the end of history, we, we, the West had won, uh, and, then, and that begged the question, did NATO need to exist? What was its purpose? The evil empire was over, and so forth and so on. So, um, uh, and there was only, in 1993, the only year that there was a reduction in global military expenditures. Since then, global military expenditures have soared. We are now at, uh, at $2 trillion uh, of known uh, expenditures. And the USA and uh, Russia are by far the two largest in, in that sphere. We are not investing in peacemaking and rec we know how to do it, but we're not investing in it. Now, as an example, in terms of historical context, uh, the, for example, we can look at uh, South Africa, very, very important. Um, and the lessons from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, and, and their inclusion. So for example, um, uh, someone else has asked about languages. Uh, in, in South Africa, they uh, uh, accepted to make official 
I think it's 11 languages, nine or 11 in their constitution. Uh, they uh, responded to the uh, terrible, uh, in, you know, the problems of apartheid and the taking of property. So there's a huge kind of process of, of redistribution, of new opportunities, of uh, empowerment. Uh, that's part of the reconciliation. All of these elements have to be addressed. I would argue we've been doing it in Canada my, most of my life, uh, or at least uh, adult life, uh, because since 1982, and you know, uh, bilingualism, biculturalism, which was part of Pierre Trudeau's framework, was a response to separatism in Quebec. And uh, official bilingualism was an idea of recognizing that, that there was a substantial part of our country uh, the, the, what, what Peter C. Newman called the two solitudes, that was disadvantaged, was linguistically excluded from official positions and official opportunities uh, and also processes such as the, the courts. So we've been working on this for 40, 45 years, uh, at least 40 years since that constitution, and we are ongoing. We're only recently dealing with it with Indigenous peoples. It might surprise you to know that for 15 years after the adoption of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, we still ran residential schools and we forced Indigenous people into the schools to, you know, to take the Indian out of the child, as that awful phrase was called. So we're barely scratching the surface with regard to Indigenous peoples, but we are trying. In Canada, at least, it's a long process. It's multi-generational, multi-dimensional, but there are many, many countries which have actually been in this path. Europe has done it in the European Union. That is a re act of reconciliation between Germans and French. And I can give you many, many other examples, but we must invest in it. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the room? If not, we're going to the board, if we can put them back up again. So uh, one of the person asked about, uh, have you seen restorative justice put in work in any European countries? Um, and noting that Canada is in the process with the Indigenous peoples. Yes, so thank you for noting that with Indigenous persons, uh, people. Uh, we, we're, as I say, just, just barely looking at uh, the very complex elements. So for your, uh, regarding Canada, um, people uh, in the audience may be interested to know that last year we adopted a very important federal law, Bill C-15, uh, which uh, obligates our country to align, the terminology that's used is align uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, which Canada has now committed to respect. We are now obliged legally to align it with all Canadian law. Uh, in fact, British Columbia as a province has already gone ahead and simply provincially, they've said, well, we're not just gonna do an alignment exercise. We are now going to require that all of our laws uh, respect that uh, declaration. Now, the declaration is profound. It, um, it speaks about uh, the right of self-determination of Indigenous peoples. It grants uh, a right of autonomy over matters that directly affect Indigenous peoples in education, in language, uh, uh, political participation, and many, many other things. We don't know what that all entails. There are, there are hundreds of Indigenous communities. There are over 50 Indigenous languages. Only I think two years ago, we adopted a law on Indigenous languages in Canada. It's barely being implemented yet. Uh, many Indigenous languages are on the virtue, ver, ver, verge of extinction, uh, so they need to be revitalized. That's a massive effort. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, th thanks for the person raising this. Um, uh, uh, certainly for, for Canada, we have a lot to do there, uh, but and not only uh, there. Now, in terms of Europe, there are many countries uh, so one part of restoration and restorative justice is repair, which may include compensation. And we learned a very, very hard lesson in Europe. At the end of the First World War, there were extreme uh, costs of repair in, in the form of financial uh, payments that were imposed on Germany under in the First World War as the vanquished, as the losers effectively, to pay for the costs of extreme damage and harm to other countries. France, for your information, uh, in the First World War, one third of the entire uh, adult male adult population either died or was injured in the First World War. So extreme harm and, and reparations were imposed on Germany. Unfortunately, they were almost impossible to pay them. And that fed into the narrative that the Nazis used and Hitler personally 
that they were unfairly treated by the French and the rest of Europe. And it gave, gave rise to this idea that not only the Germans were a great nation, but they were a, a victimized nation, a badly done by nation. And, and so this fed into the rise of, of nationalism that generated uh, you know, the, the Second World War. So we learned at the end of the Second World War, don't do that again. And, uh, and the Americans brilliantly uh, uh, adopted something called the Marshall Plan. And they said, we're not gonna impose uh, penalties on vanquished uh, Nazi Germany. We're actually going to invest in Germany and the other countries uh, and they created something called the, the German, uh, the, the Marshall Fund in each country, which still exists today. And that money was used to rebuild and construct a dynamic uh, uh, market economy and democracy where, where everyone could have a stake in living together in an integrated society and having their own well being pursued. So it's that kind of lesson in restorative justice uh, that we had to pay attention to. The European Union is considered the greatest success story of conflict prevention in the history of humankind. Uh, you know, within the European Union, there has not been a war uh, ever since its creation. Okay, thank you very much. There's a question here. Just a second. There you go. I thank you. Um, what does restorative justice look like in Ukraine and Russia? So it, 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 it's, a, again, a great question. A very, very difficult question. Uh, uh, it's going, I mean, first of all, let me say, before you can get to restorative justice, there is an ordering of things. Uh, the, the, the Norwegian uh, sociologist and father of conflict and peace studies, uh, Johan Galtung, you can look him up, he's still alive, he's about 90 years old. Uh, he, he conceived this idea of a distinction between what he calls negative peace and positive peace. So you have to, you, peace is sometimes identified as the absence of violence or the absence of war. He calls that negative peace. You have to stop it. Uh, but his basic observation is you can't actually construct positive peace, meaning a peace building and, and a resilient society that is able to manage its own conflicts without violence. You can't do that unless you have negative peace. And I think that's true. Logically, you've got to stop the killing. So I would say, first of all, in Ukraine and Russia, you got to stop the war. I mean, we should all be hoping like heck that the Turks right now, uh, President Erdogan, who's no great Democrat, let's be very clear about this, but we better hope he succeeds in negotiating some kind of a stop of the war because every day that goes on, more terrible things happen and the risks of worse go up, including mass weapon of destruction uh, incidents or, or worse. So that's one thing. Now, what does it look like? It's going to mean that people have to learn to live together no matter what happens, Ukraine and Russia are going to be neighbors. They are not going to find themselves after the war, suddenly one of them in the South Pacific. This is what uh, Germany and France, it's, it's an obvious point, but this is what Germany and France had to overcome and have knitted together over three or four generations. So, you know, in the case of Russia and Ukraine, you have many, many Russian and Ukrainians who have family members, have uh, Cousins. I mean, they're, you know, we talk about the U.S. being cousins of Canada and things like that. They literally are cousins in Ukraine and Russia. So uh, many of them. So uh, they are, their trade relationships, uh, their, their uh, riparian relationships, the Sea of Azov, uh, access to the sea. There's all sorts of codependencies and so forth that are uh, environmentally. You know, the Chernobyl. I was in Europe when Chernobyl happened, 1986, I think it was. You know, uh, it doesn't respect borders. So restorative justice will include all of these elements. Now, of course, one part of the question is going to be the responsibility of Russia as the perpetrator, as the antagonist uh, uh, for uh, causing harm. And that's gonna be, have to be part of the negotiation, part of what has to be worked out. Um, let me link that to one of the questions since our time is, is pretty much expired. Uh, a repeated question is, uh, is Russia constituting gen uh, pursuing genocide so genocide, a subject in which I've written a lot about uh, on the Uyghurs, on, 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 on in many different situations, uh, there, uh, in my view, are reasons to uh, uh, conclude, uh, or let me say, uh, it is meritorious to examine whether a genocide has now been, uh, the specter of genocide raised, because the rhetoric, that the official rhetoric of the Russian Federation and Putin's own characterization has genocidal elements. What that means is an intent 
to destroy a group uh, is in whole or in part, and that group includes an ethnic, national, linguistic, religious group. So Ukrainians as a group, if they are targeted in this way and then are being subject to certain acts which are prohibited under the Genocide Convention 1948, including killing and, and many other acts, then, then there would at least prima facie be genocide. And uh, in my view, we do not need a court to decide that. Uh, the Canadian government says they can only say that if there's a court. That is wrong in law. There is no requirement of court. We simply need to draw, examine the matter and draw the conclusion. So there may be a genocide. And my own view is there are reasons to conclude that there is now genocidal conduct by the Russian Federation in Ukraine. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna abuse my privilege as uh, the host or the mediator to ask you one final question, you know, I think that might cap things off is, so in light of everything that you've presented to us today, Professor Packer, is it not maybe time to question whether the fundamental way that we organize political communities today in terms of states and trying to get nations to align with them has not become somewhat obsolete? And that you know human beings might need to move forward. You know, I mean, when I tell my students that it's only been 300 years that we organize human political communities this way, they they're floored, right? There was a reason or reasons historically for that back then, right before the Peace of Westphalia, right? So are we possibly at a juncture now where we need to ponder, you know, breaking the current method or way of organizing human political communities and the idea of the state as the prime form of human you know, a political community organization? Uh, so thank you. I love the question because uh, uh, th that's really a question. First of all, I think it has urgency in it and the, the Ukraine situation, but not only the Ukraine situation uh, underlines that, uh, but I think, uh, I think it, it responds to bigger challenges that uh, the younger generations are going to live with if we are so fortunate. And I'm referring now to things like climate change. Uh, so the state, this idea of the state and, and even, even more so the, the short period in historical terms of the nation is simply not fit for purpose as an organizing instrument for the world in which we live in. So if we think about climate change, the challenges to the environment simply do not coincide with the state and absolutely don't coincide with any nation. Uh, they, they are uh, the challenges of the reduction of the um, uh, layers of the uh, atmosphere that protect us from UV lights uh, or uh, UV light or the destruction of, um, so the ozone layer or the lack of water uh, or, or, or many, many other challenges, uh, changes in weather patterns have nothing to do with individual states in the sense of a state or a nation being able to control or address it. It simply is a matter of uh, uh, the, the world working together through appropriate political uh, uh, structures of cooperation. That has to be, but it's not unique to the environment. So uh, it might surprise you that the, the, you know, we have a major global pandemic, uh, uh, but you might be surprised that the first Asian contagion, as it was called, which was about 30 years ago, was nothing to do with a pandemic. It was currencies. The globe is so integrated now on currencies uh, that it was actually in Southeast Asia, the Thai baht that suddenly dissolved in 24 hours and all of the loans and, and trading in Southeast Asia rippled within one day across the globe and affected the terms of trade for global integrated trade. That's 30 or 25 years ago, way before our, our even more interdependent world that now relies upon supply chains and so forth. So we live in this kind of uh, complex interdependent world for which single states alone, if I just mentioned something like cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency has nothing to do with a state. It's not, you know, uh, fiat currencies is the way states, you know, the Canadian dollar is a fiat currency. The government of Canada and its territory and its scope of jurisdiction dictates it's a tradable instrument, a um, uh, uh, money with it within our jurisdiction and between jurisdictions. Cryptocurrencies have nothing to do with that. No state controls them and so forth. So I could mention many, many other challenges where we simply must get past the, this old antiquated thinking. And some of the greatest theorists of nationalism have actually said that. They have actually said, we're actually in the death throes of the nation state. And we're experiencing where some groups still trying to push off the yoke of colonialism are asserting their national identity. 
but the organizing principle is not fit for purpose. And that's really the challenge. I think we see it in our, uh, in our own society, the complexity, the multiple uh, dimensions of our own existence, our faiths, our mixing, our uh, intermarriages and so forth, uh, that it doesn't reduce to these simple ideas. And that's the challenge for the new generation. And I, I commend anyone who, who makes a real effort on this to think of what are the alternatives that will give us the opportunity of living together sustainably and prosperously uh, in the future. All right, thank you very much. Um, I have to apologize. I think there's two questions on the board, but I think we've run out of time. So I wanted to thank you, uh, Professor Packer, for this enlightening talk and for your time today. Thank you very much. You're, you're, you're welcome. I, I think I did answer one of the other ones still on the board, but uh, I didn't get to the question about Quebec uh, linguistic bills, uh, but I, I encourage everyone to look at them because this is a question of how we live together, uh, that how you live together but thank you again for the opportunity to address everyone. And I, I wish you all best in your studies uh, and ahead. Thank you very much.